we've finally just become a family. And, and I mean that in the sense of being more than just a band. I'm going to be in a band, a punk rock band, and Bad Religion is a good influence. To me, they're like the best punk rock band ever. We've always tried to feel that uh, you're safe in this band to do what you want and say what you want and play what you want, and, and no one's going to judge you. If Bad Religion didn't exist, my songwriting style wouldn't be the way it is. Rise Against probably wouldn't sound the way it does. I owe them a lot. I grew up, you know, 14, you know, you see your first uh, Bad Religion logo of the cross, you're like, oh, what's that, you know, and you started getting involved, and then you get the first record, and then you realize that there's these words that you have no idea what they mean, and then you start looking it up, and you research, and you're like, wow, that's what I've been trying to say all the time, and these guys are actually saying it. It gives you a little bit more of, uh, of a grasp of reality when you want to express your ideas, that it's okay to go ahead, because, you know, somebody else has been waving the flag for you a lot of times, and it just kind of breaks in the idea that you know, you're know you not in this alone and there's other people out there fighting the same battles you are. So your first one in line, uh, kind of a hardcore fan. Uh, what time did you get here today? I got here at 11.30 a.m. I lost my tooth in Bad Religion last year, and it's still gone. <laughs> Ninth time seeing you guys tonight. Ninth fucking time. <laughs> He's the ultimate Bad Religion lover. This band got me more interested in a lot of things in the world and how things go on, and just made me question a lot of the things I believe about the world, about myself, about religion, and all of this. So I definitely attribute this band to being the way I think a lot. I gotta get a new tooth, but Bad Religion is awesome. <laughs>
the sun goes out to all the hopeless sinners. With grave allegiance and so meaningless of pain. The walking wounded in a pageant of contenders. Who balance on a rail of pain for just a pair of brain. And everything is dearly made by relation that brings my passion, my confession. To pray like one devout In time the great, great dreamless sleep Of a useless modern god He rose away He starry day as Wretched items with hell to pay A pen upon a pale of rain For just a little rain And everything When I first met the other guys in the band, it was uh, um, at El Camino High School. We all went to the same high school. Well, there was a great friend of mine named Tom Clement, who was also an outcast. He was one of the uh, key figures in the evolution of bad religion, because he was a very good friend with Brett Gerwitz. He introduced me to Jay and Greg. He said, hey, you guys should be in a band together, because I played guitar and Greg sang, supposedly. We hadn't heard him yet. Brett and I met. Uh, the first time when uh, Brett borrowed his dad's station wagon to go to a Ramones concert. He drove us to the Hollywood Palladium and he asked me, dude, are you ready for a nonstop bop? And I said, you're goddamn right. <laughs> and then I guess history was made. I met Greg Graffin in actually in junior high school. I didn't uh, really become friends with him uh, until we were at El Camino High School. We both showed up one day with spiky black hair and he had a shirt that said black flag and I had a shirt that said virgin. What we had in common was that uh, they were the only punk rockers in the school. So we just, we kind of just stuck to each other like Velcro and said, yeah, I think we've got to stick together because we're going to get killed. Jay didn't play anything, but it was, uh, it was pretty much uh, agreed that we could teach him bass. Control C double lip arrangement but it's kind of felt bad Into an inharmonic hole, to an inharmonic hole Consciousness has plagued us, we cannot shake it Though you think you're in control, though you think you're in control When this empathy doesn't lie, our testament of our helplessness There's no message of a beginning, no prospect of an end When we all disintegrate, it will happen again, yeah Time is so out of the minds of whores, but they can Explain what inches of the way, explain what inches of the way It's your future uncovered by curiosity, but here we are Rooted in the present day, rooted in the present day But since 
Favorite band member? Oh, of course it's Greg. I mean, come on, he's a genius. The things he writes about are like, actually have like inquisitive thought behind them, but not just that, like you can tell in like the words yeah. he writes that he's not some dipshit. Greg's an inspiration all around, not just in music. I like a lot of Brett's uh, songs. He writes a, a certain melodical line that I really tend to hone in on. Seeing Hetson's always great. I mean, uh, Greg, you know, been tearing it up over 20 years, you know, with Circle Jerks and The Bad Religion. That guy is so full of energy. And he's just a class act uh, to begin with. And just seeing him, uh, for an hour and a half straight, it's just, you know, it's one of the best punk guitarists of all time. That guy is so underrated. I like Jay myself, because I'm a bass player. He's my inspiration. Brian Baker, who is just a historic figure in punk rock, and just, like, talking to him, you're like, whoa, you played a minor threat, you know? Like, oh, that's amazing, you know? And, and Hudson and, and, and the Circle Jerks, you know? And, yeah. and uh, everybody in the band, you know, even Brooks, you know, Suicidal Tendencies and his history, you know, it's just... And Jay's obviously the most personable of all of them. He's kind of like the, the spokesperson for those guys. He's always out hanging out with, with fans and, and friends, just always there. And, you know, all those guys are just incredible. Greg is a master of lyrics. Their lyrics are like, yeah. unlike any other band I've ever seen. I'd say like the political statements he makes, you know, the, the state of government. He isn't like punk as fuck. He doesn't like, you know, he's not like, like hardcore with Big Mohawk or anything. He just does his own thing. He's been doing it for a long time. And it kind of made me realize I don't have to like have the big leather jacket and everything. You know, just like be myself more. So great to be back here in Hollywood, in the land where bad religion was born, or at least we want it to be born. Factually, of course, we came from over the hill in the San Fernando Valley. Yeah, we're in eight more minutes. We were from the valley. And, you know, if you were from OC, it was kind of cool. If you were from Hollywood, it was cool. Um, but if you were from the valley, it was like, you know, oh, you're from the valley. I was such a nerd that it didn't even, I didn't even draw a distinction between Hollywood and the San Fernando Valley. Because I saw the cool people in the valley, the surfers and the skaters, 
And I couldn't even distinguish that they were seen as geeks because they lived in the valley by the people who were living in Marina del Rey. To me, they were all the same. <laughs> And I was not part of that. I was just seen as a, as a nerd. To be a band from the Valley was second tier status to the bands in Hollywood. I remember that uh, Keith Morris uh, uh, from the Circle Jerks one time introduced us as um, a really good new band from the Valley. You know, that was his disclaimer. <laughs> we did start to build up a following, mostly because Jay and I hung out so much in Hollywood that we did start to get a Hollywood following very early on. By 1981, a lot of our best friends were just punks from Hollywood, and they started coming to our shows, legitimizing our fan base as being, uh, you know, Hollywood-based. Well, tonight we're going to give you a little bit of the old, a little bit of the new, and a little bit of the in-between. And we are so lucky because tonight, you all can join us in making our first North American live DVD ever. Right here at the Palladium. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to my left-hand man, Mr. Greg Hansen. Song's called Social Suicide. But it's time to turn the tide 
Favorite bad religion song? Along the way. Uh, Epiphany. Oh, sure. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, a really good song. I'd have to say against the grain, because you got to live against the grain. If you're an underdog, you swim against the stream all your life. Do what you want. He likes the guitar from Epiphany, but I like the lyrics of it, and yeah. also from Sorrow. The lyrics are really sweet in that song as well. I want to conquer the world. Uh, I Jesus, yeah. For me, probably Generator. <laughs> you, which was just I just liked it. It just turned me on to them as in general. I like their slower stuff for some reason, like Struck a Nerve and uh, The Answer. Let Them Eat War. I like that one. 21st Century Digital Boy is a good one. I like American Jesus. Probably I Want to Conquer the World. Oh man, there's so many. How can you choose part a favorite three, song? Part three. I'm 13. 13? Yeah. How old are you? Oh, 44. <laughs> <laughs> I turned around to Bad Religion. They stole all of my discs from the late, early, mid-80s. Mid mid Both of my kids. Love them now. What's your favorite song? Oh gosh, too many to know. What was that one playing on the way over here? Generator. Generator. <laughs>
You know, who would have thought a bunch of young punks from Canoga Park would ever make it to the Palladium stage? You know, sometimes truth is really stranger than fiction.
The first time we ever rehearsed was in our original drummer, Jay Ziskraut's mom's living room, because we were all in high school at this time. We would bounce around from house to house until whosever parents got tired of us being there. Jay wasn't in the band yet. Greg was 15, and me and Ziskraut were 17. We didn't have a bass player yet, and uh, I brought this song called Sensory Overload, and Greg brought a song called uh, World War III, <laughs> which ended up being on the EP. And uh, we learned them and played them. And it's been basically, that's been the paradigm until today. How we decided on the name Bad Religion. We didn't go very long without a name. I think, you know, we were just, we had a few rehearsals. Well, I, there were really like six or seven others and they were so horrifyingly bad. I'm glad we didn't choose them. Head cheese. That got thrown out. They were absolutely disgusting. I won't even repeat them. If you're going to call it head cheese, you might as well call it smegma. That's even more punk. A big new thing that was happening was uh, um, televangelists. Jerry Falwell was just coming into uh, prominence. Another guy, Swaggart, was coming into prominence at that time. Well, then we, we rambled on about a whole series of names that started with bad. Bad family planning. Bad family life. I can't tell you why this made an, a negative impression on us or a strong negative impression on us when we were just, you know, young teenagers. Maybe it's because Greg and I are both science geeks. <laughs> but we just thought these guys were complete jerks. We kind of considered ourselves to be progressives when we were even at such a young age. And we understood implicitly that morality is not something that in a free society is forced upon somebody. Someone said it and it kind of came and went but it kept coming back. We named our, our band Bad Religion after this kind of incipient movement of evangelical Christians who had ministries on television. Basically saying, you know, fuck off Jerry Falwell. We all nodded our head in agreement. Yeah, that's a good name. Fuck religion. <laughs> on one level, it's vindicating that we named our band that. Uh, but it's also really, kind of frightening to look at the implications. It literally was just two words put together that came to a meaning much later. And now here we are, 20 something years later, and it turns out that the thing we were railing against as little baby kids was the, the seeds of this conservative, this conservative right-wing groundswell that ended up in preemptive war and George Bush being reelected behind an illegal war on foreign soil. It felt like it was offensive enough to mean something, and that worked. Uh, this is really gonna piss our parents off. It means as much or more uh, to me today uh, than it did when we named the group. <laughs>
door needed to the gift of hope renewed eternity for you the masses of humanity still cling to their dignity masses of humanity have always always had to suffer always had to suffer The first gig was, uh, I don't know who threw it, some kid threw a party in his dad's warehouse, and it was us and Social Distortion, and we only had five songs ever written. A couple of them didn't even make the EP, actually, so that was prior to that, really early stuff. We played our five or six songs. One of the first shows he did was out in the valley at um, the Country Club in Reseda. We used to follow him to, the, to uh, Godzilla's, I mean, we, the warehouses. All kinds of places. I remember my buddy Tom came up to me and said, hey man, uh, you guys are really good. Just don't break up and you'll get popular. <laughs> so that's, that's actually the advice I give to younger bands nowadays, because <laughs> that was good advice. Back then, if you were a punk band, you had to have a logo. The Black Flag, to me, has the best punk logo ever. And the Circle Jerks had the Skanker Man, and you know, everyone has a cool logo. So we needed to have a logo. So I went in my art room and I drew up the Bad Religion logo and I took it to practice. And Brett came in with this piece of paper with that crossbuster thing on it and said, look at this. And we kind of all laughed and, and then said, yeah, that's easy to spray paint on a wall and, and unbelievably offensive. Cool. <laughs> Let's just run with that. People think there's so much hatred in our logo. Well, I don't know why people would jump to that conclusion. It wasn't me meant to be against Christians. I know plenty of religious Christians who are not offended at all by it. Bad religion is in no way anti-Christ. Uh, Christ was probably the most progressive liberal in history. <laughs> and when you see that crossbuster at my house, it just means Christianity is not practiced here. You know, he was there to talk about, hey man, this is, you know, it's all about forgiveness, and it's all about the meek and the poor and the infirm and, and loving them and loving each other. And, you know, Christ's revolution was forgiveness. First of all, what is that slash? Well, it's the international symbol for no or disallowed. Bad religion logo is just meant to say we detest religion. <laughs> it's not meant to be anti-Christian at all. It's not a hateful thing at all. It just means look elsewhere. It didn't have some kind of intent. It was just offensive and cool. <laughs> to me, it does have meaning. That symbol does have meaning, and I think it's a good logo. Since you've seen us last time, I've developed a few new tricks, and uh, I've been going to uh, stage school, learning some new uh, stage maneuvers, you know, to build up my uh, stage presence. So you might see me doing this a lot. That's one of the basic ones they taught me. Uh, it's called the balcony point, and we don't usually get to play in places with balconies, so tonight it's really working. How's it going in the cheap seats up there, anyway? Here's a song called Change of Ideas. Once in the bottle of rock, but the fields are washed away. And a fountain now stand when the heavens are overlaid. And the time will see ahead when the flames are over. Last summer during the Warp Tour, uh, <laughs> I did a lot of field work uh, on American culture, and uh, I learned that there was a new force in the universe that I had not hitherto, henceforth, known about. 
And uh, apparently there's a new force in the universe called God's Love. Striding that mantle, apparition like a drop on a vacant street. Silently but set by the hands of time, indelicate in its fury. An amorant crack and skeleton deal, the unrelenting gravity. But my heart is proud, more helpless, fixed to soften up rapidly. Tell me, tell me where is the love in a God's creation when there's no above, there's no justice. first uh, introduction to punk rock to me was uh, in January of 1977. CBS ran a, a TV show in 1977 called 1976, The Year in Review, to which they dedicated the last 10 minutes to the Sex Pistols, basically mocking them and saying, look how gross these guys are. Look, how, look at these idiots. 
uh, and I was sold. I, I just went in hook, line and sinker, said, that's for me, I'm gone, bye. I knew probably from about nine years old I wanted to be a singer. Punk wasn't around when I was nine. I think what got me into punk rock and inspired to be in a band was when I first started playing guitar, there was uh, the bands that were popular were like Kiss and Aerosmith and Queen, and there's these huge stage productions, larger than life images, and uh, I could not relate. I never thought I, I could be that. You know, when your hero is Keith Emerson, you might as well just quit because you can never be a virtuoso like that, you know? But then you hear Johnny Ramone, and you think, wow, you know, I can do that. When I heard punk rock, it was the most heavy guitar oriented rock I've ever heard, and it seemed accessible. Like, yeah, I could do that. It breaks down the barrier between the star and the fan. It, you know, it's the great leveler. Got me excited about the whole new genre of punk rock back then. By the time uh, I was 15, Rodney on the Rock had become my main focus every Sunday night at midnight, I think, or 10 o'clock. And uh, those bands were so inspiring to me that, uh, you know, I really felt like I was a part of something here in L.A., even though I was too young to go hang out in Hollywood. There's another element, of course, that's just as important as the musical side, and that is the feeling like I just did not belong. The, f the feeling that I was a complete outcast in Southern California culture. I'm not sure why I wanted to be a punk rocker, but I always felt like I didn't belong, and punk rock kind of gave, gave a voice to that for me. And I was a real geek. I probably still am, but <laughs> back then, man, I was a real, nerdo. People in my junior high school were getting laid and smoking weed. I mean, they just looked at me in disgust. So uh, it was partly the feeling of being a complete outcast. I went to a high school uh, in 1980 where the coolest kids were punk rockers. So I wanted to fit in so I joined a team of outcasts. The formative years, your best friends discover this kind of music. And uh, I guess I'd been at summer camp or something and came in late. Everybody's hair was funny. So I want a piece of that, I said. So I got some. Everybody wants to dance in a playpen, but nobody wants to play in my garden. See those hippies on an angry line. But they don't get my meaning.
Atomic Fuck Art. yeah! The bands uh, that, that influenced me back in the day, the ones that had the greatest impact on me were uh, definitely, number one, The Germs, uh, Darby Crash and The Germs with Pat Smear and uh, Don Bowles and Lorna. And they, uh, their album, G.I., was just transformative for me. The biggest uh, band that, that I think had any kind of influence on what we did uh, was the adolescents because they were doing three-part harmonies and they were the first band that we'd ever seen like as a punk rock band doing three-part harmonies. Black Flag, uh, maybe not musically but attitude, the way they just dominated their space, you know, even with that whole different chain of singers and uh, of course, you know, Henry being from Washington, when he joined, we paid a lot more attention to it. I always admired their total domination of what they did. It was their show, their stage, uh, they were frightening, which I, I still get a kick out of. I love having that, that aspect of it. When it comes to influences, I am always, I always qualify it by saying I was influenced at a very young age and having started in Bad Religion at the age of 15, much of Bad Religion's early history, I was still being influenced because I was at, that's a very influential age. So, but before the, the band really started, I was influenced by pop sounding, you know, pop rock music that was not necessarily commercial. Stuff like Todd Rundgren and, you know, Utopia and uh, things like that were uh, very influential to me. I have, I, you know, I love all kinds of music. I, I've always loved R&B uh, from a very young age. Um, I think my favorite group of all time is the Beatles. And this might be surprising to Bad Religion fans, but I, I guess, you know, I. I'd put the top, uh, the top rock groups of all time uh, in order as, uh, you know, the Beatles, the Beach Boys, and the Stones. Um, I know I'm a weirdo. Most guys wouldn't put the Beach Boys second, but, um, and, uh, and I, you know, I still stand by that today. And I know there's not a punk band in the top three, but that's, that's how it is for me. The greatest musical love for me is still Elvis Costello. I think that the, um, the angry young man that he was, and now he's kind of a bitter middle-aged man, is, that's for me. I just, it's fascinating to me because it, it sums up a lot of my feelings fairly quickly. So I, I've been pretty consistent with Elvis Costello <laughs> through my life. Other things have come and gone, but he's certainly the one uh, that I could name as the number one influence uh, j musically, the one that fills the hole in my soul. Yeah. 
We'd like to do a number now that's dedicated to our favorite people in the world. And I'm talking about a song called You. There's a place where everyone can be happy. It's the most beautiful place in the whole fucking world. It's made of candy canes and planes and bright red choo choo trains. The meanest little boys, most innocent little girls. And you know, I wish that I could go there. That's a road that I have not found. But I wish you the best of luck, dear. Drop a card or letter to my side of town. Cause there's no time for fuss and fighting, my friends. But baby, I'm amazed at the hate that you can send. And you painted my entire world. The three most frightening words ever invented by any religion. Come join us. So you say you gotta know why the world goes around and you can't find the truth in the things you found and you're scared shitless cause evil abounds. Come join us. I can tell you I'm about to wait a minute for a battle red people with us hammer the tap. Family to keep you and call brethren. Come join us. All we want to do is change your mind All you need to do is close your eyes Come join us Come join us Come join us Don't you see all the trouble that most people are in And that they just want you further out of the dead But I swear to you are different from all of them Come join us I can tell you I'm looking for a way to live Where truth is determined by consensus I first met uh, the guys in the band when I was in the Circle Jerks about 1980 at this hot dog stand, Okie Dog, where all the punk rockers used to hang out. I think it was Greg came up to me and said, hey, we got, we're in this band from the Valley, here's our demo, check it out. And I said, okay, well, if I like it, uh, we're going to be on Rodney on the Rock radio show this weekend. Uh, we played over the air. So I listened to the tape, and it was good, so we played over the air and kind of became friends with the guys. I just remember early on just 
he would drive us around to parties. He was two years older, so he would have the, he had the wheels, and he would he wasn't from the valley. He knew all the real happening parties, the punk parties out here in the L.A. Basin. I asked him to come in and play a solo on a song that I wrote called Part Three. He was in the Circle Jerks, and, and we were playing a lot of shows together, and I said, I have this idea for kind of dueling banjos in this, in this song. I want you to kind of play lead guitar against Brett at the same time. And he came into the studio and recorded his solo, and he never left. <laughs> he just stayed. It was like, I think he's in the band now. Greg was by far the most uh, social of any punk in LA in the early developing years of the punk scene. I guess around 1990 when the Circle Jerks broke up for the first time is when Bad Religion kind of like became my main, my main band. I got kind of lucky as the Circle Jerks were doing this, Bad Religion was doing this. So I am blessed, thank you. Favorite part of being in a band is uh, the process of writing the song and then recording it and hearing it come to life in the studio uh, with, a, with a final mix. Uh, to this day, that's just, it blows me away. And that, that process is what it's all about for me. You know, the songwriting process with Battle Legend is, is, it really hasn't evolved that much. Uh, Brett Gurowitz and Greg Graffin are the two main songwriters. People think of Bad Religion as a great uh, collaboration in songwriting, mostly by Brett and myself. Brett and I don't really sit in the same room and create songs. We are very studious and isolated when we, when we write. Everybody goes to their corners of the world and writes their stuff. I write a batch of songs. Greg writes a batch of songs. We present them to the band. They kind of have this uh, healthy songwriting competition, and we're all just the benefactors of that. All of my best songs have come when there's some intellectual puzzle I'm trying to solve. I think we have 220-something songs, and they've collaborated, really collaborated on maybe three. <laughs> I don't know how this came about, because we, we met totally by chance, but I think our songs sound really similar. Um, but we don't consult each other when we're writing them at all. So, I don't, you know, I don't know how that happened. I guess we just evolved similar styles over the years. There have been songs that Brett and I have co-written. Mm -hmm. But even those, the idea would have originated with Brett or myself. And then the uh, verses get rounded out or filled in by the other person. But they're both pertaining to that original point. More today than it used to be is, you know, me and Greg will have a little bit of interaction. Like, I'll give him feedback on his songs, maybe help him come up with parts, and he'll do it on my songs. But, but it's still basically the same thing. I'm not sure if I'm that good at writing popular songs in the sense of being radio-style friendly songs for Bad Religion. Most of the songs that are most famous for Bad Religion have come from Brett's brain. I think I can do that with melody that might be my strongest gift, is that I can take words and create an uplifting pop melody. I'm not quite a cynic, but uh, I, I do tend to see the uh, darker side of things often. If you ask me just to write a real feel-good song, I don't know if I could do it. And yet, some of my songs, because I'm trying to solve this intellectual puzzle, maybe I solve it. and it, results in a feel-good song. Sometimes, especially with Brian Baker and Brooks Wackerman now, uh, Brett will bring a song in or something and say, you know, here's an idea, uh, and just let everybody go on it because it's funner that way, right? You get all these people just creating all this stuff. And sometimes songs come in and they go, no, this is exactly what I want you to play because this is what I hear in my head. My favorite thing about being in a band is uh, contributing to the songs, being a part of the, uh, you know, writing process and watching the evolution of a song. Um, even if I didn't write it, it's still exciting to be, you know, um, in the process of, of trying to create something. You know, a lot of people ask, does the music or the lyrics come first? And uh, I've, I've had songs where it's been just a title, and then everything fell into place from the title. I've had th times when I've had a just a riff in my, in my brain, guitar riff, 
and I fit the words to that. I just wanted to say for posterity that I write my own lyrics <laughs> because I'm proud of them and I think it's they're probably more important to the songwriting than the music actually in, in the case of bad religion songs. So it, it goes on a song by song basis I guess you'd say. With your high and mighty end. Your action speaks so loud, I can't hear what you're saying. Hey, sister, pleading hard with all of your compassion. Your labor soon hurt, but can't assert temptation. Hey, man of science, with your firm grooves of pleasure. Can you improve this wage with well, that you gather? Hey, mother of mercy, can you light my food forever? Is your big gun the tear travel a treasure? Life of me. 
Anyway, without further ado, everybody, we'd like to present to you now, The Generator. Like a rock, like a planet, like a bucket and a bomb. I remain a printer by the joy and the madness. I encounter everywhere I turn. I've seen it all along. In books and magazines, like a twit before dying, like a photograph there's a fire behind the window There's an ugly laughing bear Like a honey bird in silence Like a butt on my door It's a generator The way the band ended up on Atlantic was this, and it's, it's, it's kind of ironic because, you know, we, we were a punk band on an indie that was doing well. Epitaph was doing great. Bad Religion was doing great. So a lot of people wonder, you know, why the hell would they leave and go to Atlantic? The move to Atlantic kind of, it, it fell under that umbrella of Bad Religion and Epitaph kind of outgrowing each other and smothering each other. I didn't know at that time that Brett's work at Epitaph was on the verge of being so successful. There was a thought that I, you know, Brett and I said like, well, you know, if we could get Bad Religion off of Epitaph, it would take away a lot of the workload at Epitaph and we could kind of focus on other bands. And I agreed with that and thought, you know, it's something we should look into. Not seriously, we were like, well, let's just go see what we're worth out in the market. An A&R guy at Atlantic, an old friend of ours, used to write for a fanzine, says, hey man, you know, you should sign to Atlantic, it's cool here, I'll be your A&R guy, we know each other. You know, on a punk label, you can only ever sell, you know, what you're doing, which is great, but you know, don't you want to be even bigger? Don't you want everyone to be, have a chance to be exposed to your music? And everyone in the band, including myself, thought, yeah, that would be a good opportunity, and you know, maybe an indie label can't, in this day and age, you know, reach the, you know, the, the mass market. 
we ran into Danny Goldberg, who is a great guy, is Nirvana's manager and Bonnie Race manager and a straight up guy. And, and he really did understand what we were trying to accomplish. And all of a sudden it was, well, here's a legitimate contender who would actually be in our corner. So it sounded like a good idea. And, and, we, and uh, we went through with it. And something like two weeks later, the Offspring song, Come Out and Play, got on the radio, and that record just went through the roof and uh, went platinum and went beyond, you know, it sold something like five million in the US now, um, proving that a punk band can do it on an indie label. By then, Bad Religion had signed to Atlantic, and Offspring and Rancid were on Epitaph, becoming superstars, and I would have like for my band to have been on Epitaph becoming a super, superstar too. <laughs> you know, people do need to understand why all these things happened. It's like until you're like in a band and working at the label and saying we gotta get balance here, uh, it wasn't gonna make any sense. The truth is that if it had been slightly different timing, I don't think Bad Religion ever would have gone to Atlantic. We went to Atlantic amidst a very difficult time in terms of band communication. So it wasn't such a, such a glorious decision, such a great feeling to put out a record on a major label. I think the naivete on my part about going to a major label was the turnover rate for employees and executives there is insane. Like every three months, it's like you get a whole new crew. Through no fault of Atlantic Records, no fault of Epitaph. So many cultural factors conspired at that moment to make it an inauspicious move that uh, we just sort of trotted along and, uh, you know, didn't realize the direction we were headed. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but you know a lot of guys in big rock bands take along a personal bodyguard or a technical assistant or... Well, not this guy. And it's not only because I'm not in a big rock band, it's because I'm old-fashioned. That's right. I still use a cord on my microphone, and that means sometimes I gotta switch mics. We still use our own towels, and our old, old fat, hey wait, you don't have a cord on your base, you. Anyway, I am privileged to be able to show you something that I've developed over the years. It's a special technique in changing microphones. And uh, if you'll indulge me, uh, I'd rather do it here in front of stage and go back there and do it. All right. Brooks, do your little thing that it, this really adds a little to the tension. Never do that. Eat your heart out, Metallica.
Nirvana came along and just blew all the doors open for everybody. Next up is Green Day and The Offspring and all that. And so 
everyone's thinking the same thing for us. I had just put out a record by The Offspring that uh, it was just selling millions of records. And, and Epitaph was a tiny indie at the time. It was me and five other people. Brett and I were working at Epitaph. So Epitaph's growing through the roof. It's just, you know, the, every band is starting to sell big numbers and punk rock is now huge. Everything was getting so intense that I just, there was no way in the world I was able, to, I was going to be able to do Bad Religion and Epitaph at the same time. Uh, bad Religion is taking up all of our time. It used to just be more of a three month a year kind of hobby-ish thing and now Greg says, I'm not gonna go back to school. I wanna tour more with the band uh, and spend more time dedicated to the band. But that's not gonna work at Epitaph with Brett because he needs to spend more time with the label. There's no way that I could just abandon Epitaph at this moment because it was just exploding at the seams. And I'm kind of torn between the middle saying, well, okay, I'm either gonna answer phones or I'm gonna play the bass guitar. I'm playing the bass guitar. And I thought the lesser of two evils was to leave Bad Religion because I thought they would, would uh, be able to go on without me. And it turned out, of course, they were able to. Hey, Brett made the right decision uh, because he had to take care of his company. I, I really believe that. Um, and when he left, it was, it, it was huge. And I called Greg and I said, you know, I, Brett's leaving. When Brett left the band, it was a frightening moment. I wasn't able to really understand the impact that it was going to have. I believed that somehow we could overcome the drawbacks of losing Brett by maybe uh, elevating our um, commercial publicity and just trying to paint a lighter picture of the band and where it came from as opposed to the real substance of the band, which is its songwriting. Uh, in a sense, I really believed all these things could overcome the uh, shortcomings of losing Brett. Plus, I was pissed that he left. I mean, plain and simple, there was just an, uh, you know, it's like, if someone just says, I'm bailing, and you're a partnership, you, you, you get angry. I never acted out the anger towards Brett, because I thought that would be juvenile and futile. He made a decision, and uh, I had to live with it. Some of my anger I put into uh, just moving forward with the band, making, maybe it's what saved the band, I tried to make the band just as good without him. Well, that didn't happen. But in a sense, the band bridged a very treacherous gap, and that is the gap of Brett's absence. And we wouldn't have bridged that gap, I don't think, if I didn't have that drive. So wherever it came from, it ended up being a good thing. We had varying degrees of success through those years. Overall, those were the the kind of the dark ages of bad religion. In 93, about a year before I joined, I was uh, dating a woman who worked at Epitaph. It was 92. And I got a pre-release of the Recipe for Hate cassette. And this cassette was just changed my life. It was stuck in my, literally stuck in the tape deck of my car, couldn't come out. And I listened to it constantly and said, you know, if I had made better choices musically in my life, I could be in a band that good. Because I was friends with this lady at Epitaph, I had occasion to hang out with Brett and Greg Hetson. Well, when I was with Greg Hetson, I would always say, you know, if Brett ever leaves, call me first. The next day, I would say the same thing to Brett. If you ever get rid of Hetson, give me a call. I mean, I was just trying to cover all the bases, but it was just fantasy land because no one was going anywhere until I got a phone call in 1994 from Greg Hetson saying, uh, do you want to be in the band because uh, Brett left? And it was just, it was unbelievable. And I said yes immediately, um, because it was something I wanted to be part of so badly. We knew that uh, if, you know, Brett leaving was a big blow to the band, so we had to replace him with someone of very high status. And Brian was uh, a friend of the band's, so we thought, well, can't hurt to ask. Yeah. And he was living in LA, and he was excited, so. Uh, you know, we got along great, and uh, he was a perfect replacement. I think getting Brian uh, was probably the right choice because Brian came in with his own credentials. It wasn't like trying to get a Brett alike. 
let's get someone like Brad. I was like, no, we just got this other guy who came in from the East Coast and had his own history. Because you can't really replace a songwriter like Brad. That's just not something you can do. And I think that's something that we've always kind of thought about is if somebody leaves, uh, it's an opportunity to go and find uh, the best person you can find, like Brooks Wackerman, right? When he came into the band, it's like, okay, I've never even seen anybody like you. You're insane. How I joined Bad Religion was through uh, mutual friends in the industry. And um, after I quit my old band, uh, about four or five people recommended me uh, to Brett Gerwitz. So he called me up, uh, gave me a list of songs to learn, and um, I went down there and auditioned and uh, felt natural. So here I am at the Palladium. He is the sickest drummer I've ever played with. <laughs> He's just a mad, gifted musician. I come from a very musical family. My uh, dad's a music teacher, so as soon as I started walking, he, he put me on the drum throne and started teaching me beats and rudiments. I love the fact that uh, Brooks is very interested in learning, and I think, you know, we get along so well because our parents are all our educators. When I was about six years old, he uh, took me to the teachers that he took from. Um, a jazz teacher and a classical teacher, so I took lessons for about seven years. As he's been in the band longer, and we've kind of all started to realize we're all relatively decent people, he's really become an, an unbelievably great guy. And uh, I, I really like him. Brooks, very dry sense of humor. Very, very funny guy. I just hate when drummers have always have to warm up on their little practice pads, very annoying. Brooks is the best drummer I've ever played with, and he is a uh, genuinely thoughtful and gentle guy. He has uh, the most complete lack of pretension and hostility from a, from a native Californian that I've ever seen. I really don't hate anything about Brooks. Is it possible I might not ever come upon something I hate about him? Just watch it. I'm watching you, Brooks. <laughs>
thank you. This is a song called Cease. Thank you. On an individual level, I know that music has the power to change lives because it's changed my life. You know, I've had people come up to me and say, hey man, you know that, uh, that seven inch you did with Noam Chomsky back in blah de blah really changed the way I think about the world and, and you know, really influenced me to, uh, to uh, you know, be involved politically. I don't really know if, uh you know, in the break room at the House of Representatives, if they all sit around and listen to the Empire Strikes First and go, you know what, maybe our system is flawed. I don't really know if it has that kind of far-reaching power, but as uh, improving the quality of one's life, I can't think of anything better. I don't think music or any band could, 
changes the world, it, it enlightens people, it gives people ideas, thought, but I don't think anybody's changed the world globally or in, in a big way just through music, unfortunately. On a global level, I would say that's not very uh, accurate because music, as we know it, only affects a small fraction of the population. Even if it's a highly influential fraction, it's still a very small fraction. There's a world out there that exists independent of music, and it's going to go on existing independent of music. When people talk about music making a difference, I always assume that they talk about some kind of John Lennon feed the world aspect of making a difference. I'm not sure if it can change uh, a cultural psyche for the better. I don't think so. Uh, I think human beings in general are pretty evil. And so they'll always gravitate towards the negativity that they can reach for, whether it's fear of terror or Marilyn Manson. They're gonna blame somebody. It delights and angers. It's, uh, God, it's just such a big thing. You know, it's, I, I, I'm a musician, you know, I, I don't go an hour without listening to music. Um, and I know that most of my friends are the same way. So, uh, you know, I certainly hope that it's, uh, that it's as motivational for others as it is for me. Yeah, music changes people, and I take that very seriously uh, in songwriting and performance. And uh, I believe I, I go with that a priori, that preconceived belief that what I'm doing is going to affect people's lives. The music is a force for social change, and even if sometimes these uh, these days it seems hopeless. I don't think any of us should give up hope and, and we have to keep trying.
just want to say it has been my pleasure and privilege to play with the best players in punk rock now. Brian Baker, Jay Bentley, Brooks Wackerman, Greg Hudson, and of course my partner Brett Kerwitz. But the great privilege of all, of course, is being able to play for you guys for so long. I thank you so much for coming. And thanks, hope we'll see you next time along the way. I'm not a very good commentator on the legacy of bad religion, and only because I've distanced myself from the punk culture. We took a sound from a small scene, right, a small uh, local scene, and through Epitaph, we kind of brought it to the world and popularized it. We didn't invent it. Minor Threat really did invent a certain, that, that, that certain tempo, which we stole from the bad brains, but just refined it a little bit uh, or just messed with it a little bit. That whole hardcore thing, I think Minor Threat is one of the bands that would be identified as the beginning of that, and, and I'm very proud of it. Uh, the only downside of the Minor Threat is when Straight Edge went tragically wrong and turned into, you know, marauding gangs of vegans smacking drinks out of people's hands, which it was never the intention. I mean, it was just one of our songs that preached sane personal politics, but it was never supposed to be some sort of, you know, youth movement. Uh, in any way, shape, or form. Bad Religion, that legacy will be join the best band you can find and don't quit. That one's easy. As I've gotten older, I always have to justify why I'm going up on stage each night. To me, it's because I'm not a peer to these people. I'm not their peer anymore. Right. I'm not someone who relates to them on their own terms. I think I relate to them because I symbolize something to them and I hope it's something uplifting and hopeful. The legacy of bad religion will probably, uh, it'll be twofold. It, it, it would probably fairly intertwined with Epitaph Records, uh, and it would probably uh, hinge a lot on our catalog. That, you know, we have 15 albums out and 25 years as a band. That's, that's a long time for any kind of music, especially this. You know, through punk music, the world has become alive to me. I've learned more about the world because of the punk ethic that I grew up with. I hope that same ethic can do the same for the audience. A lot of my friends who are in bands who, who are just, you know, huge and, and have become superstars uh, have told me that, uh, you know, my band was important to them and was, you know, influenced them in, in coming up. So I guess we do have some kind of an influence. I know people talk about us as being influential. And, and I understand that. I, I can't really allow myself to think like that because it, it skews your head. And you start thinking that you're doing something important and the minute you think that, you're dead. Because you're no longer thinking that what you're doing is for you and fun. I've gotten more introverted as I've gotten older uh, to try to make sense of uh, the planet, make sense of our culture, make sense of our place in nature and try and distill that 
in a communicable form for our audience. And so, in a way, I think that has helped bad religion not become stale, but it comes at a cost. And that cost is that I've become less able to comment on what's going on in, in the punk world. What I see in the future of bad religion is uh, great hope, personal hope, that we will play fewer shows per week on tour than we are currently playing. We never really plan more than a year ahead because no one knows what's going to happen. Of course, at this, time, this point, someone could die of old age. The ongoing joke is five more years, and we've been saying that for 20 years. I think we have a couple of good records left in us. I'm excited about writing another album. We're doing it sort of one album at a time. We're going to do, uh, we're working on a double album right now. We've always ta taken it really one album at a time. Never really set goals, just try to write consistently good material and uh, go with it that way. As long as Brett and I feel inspired to write, I think we're going to come up with good albums. What I see in the future for Bad Religion um, is hopefully 10 more records. It really revolves around the idea that this is a hobby. Uh, it's become our job, which is rare, uh, but it is still a hobby, and it's something that, that you have to be passionate about, and you really have to like it. You can't do it if you don't like it, because then it's a job, and you're not sincere. Most of my friends work for a living doing things that they don't like to do, and uh, I, I just feel so fortunate that what I do is something that I would do for free, something that I've done my entire life. Uh, it's a privilege, and uh, you know, it's just people don't get to do this, and uh, I'm well aware of how rare that is. And uh, you know, I'm, if you'll excuse the uh, reference to a deity, I, I feel blessed. I just hope that bad religion can continue to be a source for my creative output. And that's all I've ever looked at it as since I was a kid. Hey, do what you want, but don't do it around me. I don't listen to some patient breed apathy. I sit on my ass a goddamn day. I'm missing the big and the boy with nothing. Do say what you must, do all you can Break all the fireworks and go to hell with Superman And die like a champion in your head Yeah, I don't know if the billions will survive But I believe in God when one and one are five But my degree is mad and I'm right to the core I dare now the building not to pass Come on. 
was his goal. And he built his great empire. He slaughtered his own kind. Then dying off his man, killing himself with his own eyes. But like it all.
Nothing like drag killers after a show. For a wet stud like myself. Los Angeles is burning. The world is burning. Yes. It's 74 years old, right there. Before they had metal detectors. People don't eat this. This is much better than this. Sometimes I think I would have, uh, if I could have changed one thing, I think I would have stayed and played on Into the Unknown. <laughs> Maybe I would have put out <clears throat> a killer punk record instead of Into the Unknown. Maybe that would have elevated Bad Religion's status at the time. I'm pretty proud of, uh, the, of my work with Bad Religion, and granted, I've been in the band for only three and a half years, but um, it's definitely, you know, expanded my horizons as a musician. If anything, maybe a hairstyle that would change. Can I modify my DNA to have better hair? I mean, I'm somebody who does not live with regrets. Mm -hmm. I feel like if you analyze the past too much, you become obsessed with the past. I can't change the past. And I can't really change the future. Uh, I would probably uh, not wait till like my late twenties to start taking guitar lessons. <laughs> I wouldn't change anything. Not a single thing. At the risk of sounding arrogant, I feel the past speaks for itself. I wouldn't trade anything that happened at all when the band is over and we all look back at it and say like that was. Uh, that was the majority of my life. That was what I did with my life. And I'm totally okay with that. Where's my makeup? Where's my scarf? <laughs> I told you. I'm definitely grateful for the success we've had so far. And I never expected us to ever get this far in the first place. Most importantly, if you join Bad Religion, don't leave. Just don't. I kind of have a strong belief that everything happens for a reason. And if everything hadn't happened the way it did, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you right now. And I love sitting here and talking to you right now. I want to be doing this. So wanting what I have uh, is a direct result of everything that we've gone through. I wouldn't change a thing.